So Esther, the fourth chapter, we're going to read that entire chapter. Amen. We got some Bible thumpers in the house, some readers. Amen. All right. So let us read. Starting at verse one, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city. And he cried with a loud and a bitter cry and came even before the king's gate. For none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatchet, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it is and why it was. So Hatchet went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her. I'm going to say it again, and to charge her that she should go unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. And Hatchet came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hatchet and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces, do you know that whatsoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king, into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Today we're going to talk about the topic of becoming the preparation, the process, and producing while elevating. Amen. Yeah, that just got deep. I just saw them eyebrows go, whoa. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you now, Lord, thanking you, God, for this day. Thanking you that your presence can be felt tangibly in this sanctuary. And I am believing, Lord God, that it is going through the data lines, and it is piping right into the homes, oh God. The very anointing that is resting right here in this house, oh God, is resting in the home of someone who is watching right now online in the name of Jesus. Father, that you are going into their house and beginning to push out the darkness in the name of Jesus. Lord God, that you are touching their mind, bringing them into a place where they have the mind of Christ, where they are operating fully in the mind of Christ, where they are pushing out all doubt, all 
all fear, all wonder, all hurt, all shame, all guilt, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, they are exchanging beauty for ashes, oh God, that they are getting joy for the oil of mourning, oh God. Father, we thank you for what you are doing in our lives, for how you have called us and chosen us for such a time as this. Lord, you could have had us birth in any time. But you chose this one. So, Father, I thank you for calling us your people, for giving us what is necessary, oh God, to be able to get the work done, to be able to get the job done, to advance your kingdom, oh God. Lord, to snatch souls from hell and populate heaven with them in the name of Jesus, that you have given us your word, you've given us your power, you've given us your anointing to break the chains that bind. And Lord God, you've given us hinds feet and set us high upon a rock. You are that rock. You've given us access into heavenly places. And Father, we know that we cannot do this without you. So Father, I pray that you would reach deep into the souls of your people as we begin to talk through the preparation, the process, and producing while elevating. And they will begin to see themselves in this account, in the annals of your history, Father, that they would recognize self, that they would deny their flesh and allow their spirit man to arise so they can become who you dispatch them to this earth to be. We thank you, God. We bless you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' matchless and mighty name. And every saint would shout hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. Give them a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. I shouldn't have ate that candy before I came up here. Amen. <laughs> Let me chew this candy up. Otherwise, I'm going to be spitting candy all on Shar's feet. Amen. Now, in Bible study, we've been talking a lot about identifying purpose. Not just identifying any purpose, but actually recognizing what your purpose in this earth is. Many of us have spent thousands and thousands of dollars trying to figure out who we are, why we're here, what it is that we are called to do. We have read every self-help book. We have looked through all kinds of scriptures just trying to figure out who am I? Lord, why am I here on this planet? What is it that you need for me to do? And so as we all have, uh, many of us have taken the test to find out what giftings are actually in operation within us. Once we identify it, the next thing that we have to do is we have to choose to embrace it and accept it. We have to fight the devils that have been fighting our mind, trying to tell us that we are nothing. We never can. We never will be. It'll remind us, remind us of all the things that we've done in our past, how we failed here, how we failed there, all of the things. I don't care what it is that you've done, but I need you to know that God knew it was going to happen before you even got here. And he will use your mistakes and elevate you even in the midst of your enemy. So we're talking about purpose. Your purpose being bigger than you. But you've got to understand that there really is a process. Amen? So if you look at the book of Esther, in 10 short chapters, you see the providential hand of God in action on behalf of his nation. The people of God were facing extinction at the hand of Haman's demonic plot to annihilate every Jew and Jewess in the land. Yet God had strategically placed Esther in a position to intercede on behalf of her people. She was the one that was placed in between the king's decree and the people who were going to be annihilated. Now, although Haman had set in place a decree from the king, he didn't understand who it was that they served. The Jews served the king of kings. They served the Lord of lords. They served the God who knows the end from the beginning. They served Elohim him, the mighty God. They served El Shaddai, God Almighty. They served Jehovah Jireh, God their provider. They served Jehovah Rapha. He is God, my 
healer. He served El Moshe, God of salvation, God the deliverer. They serve the I am that I am. That means God is all that we will ever need and then some. That is who it is that they serve. So regardless of the enemy's plot, God was always in the midst of it. Now as we look at our text on the day, we see the record of how God used Esther, how he used Mordecai, and how he used Hethic to save his nation by exposing Haman's plot to the king. Now the thing that most of us miss is this. When we read this account that God used everyday, ordinary people, that look like me and you. But he used them to take a stand. He used them to advance his kingdom and to save his nation. In chapter 4, we see Esther already positioned in the palace. It was a place of comfort. She was enjoying life as the queen of King of uh, King Artaxerxes. And she had uh, everything that she could want or need. And one day, everything in her entire life got flipped upside down. Is there anybody in the house who's ever experienced it? You're walking along and everything's going really well. And next minute, you know, the enemy presents himself and he tears up everything. Your kids are acting crazy. Somebody's going to jail. Somebody's in the hospital. The person you're closest to dies. Everything begins to shut down around you. And you don't know what it is that you're going to do. But you know the God that you serve. But prior to becoming queen, prior to becoming this woman who would be brave enough to risk her life on behalf of her people, she had to go through the preparations before the promise. She had to embrace the process of her journey in order to produce those type of results. What are you talking about, apostle? I'm glad you asked, amen? Esther had to be prepared to be in the service as royalty catch that she had to be prepared to be in service as royalty oh come on royal priesthood she had to embrace who she was becoming she had to renounce her own history and who she thought she was upon elevate upon elevation she had to produce results from the position she was holding. Let's talk about preparation before the promise. Romans 8 and 28 says this. It tells us that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, if you read the book of Esther, you will come to learn that Esther was an orphan. She had lost both of her parents and was being raised by her cousin Mordecai. By, the time this, by this time, the Jews had already been released from captivity and were allowed to return back home to Jerusalem. But Mordecai chose to remain in a Persian capital. He raised Esther as his own daughter. Now, the thing that I found interesting about this story is that nobody knew that they were Jews, nor did they know that she was an orphan. In other words... Esther did not allow what had happened to her to stop her from allowing God to develop her or to work through her. Oh, come on, somebody need to catch that on today. Oftentimes, we make the mistake of disqualifying ourselves when we experience trauma in our lives. Trauma leaves what is known as soul debris. Soul debris come in the form of an unworthy feeling, always feeling rejected, feeling like you're always going to fail no matter what happens, no matter how you try, no matter how much you put towards it. You're always feeling abandoned or you're always feeling accursed. Uh, so those soul debris in you, until they are actually cleaned up, your vision for greater will be blocked by what was left behind through the whirlwind of traumatic events in your life, keeping you from ever seeing beyond where you are right now, keeping you from ever seeing beyond who or what you've become, or uh, keeping you from becoming who you were designed to be by the God of all creation. I don't care what it was. It could be rape. It could be molestation. It could be divorce, homelessness, failure of the third grade, mistakes from your past, addiction, abortion, no matter the issue. Jeremiah 29 and 11 still says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They are thoughts of good and not for 
evil to give you a hope and a future to bring you to an expected end. In other words, he's letting us know the plans that he has for our future will bless us and not curse us. He has organized things in our lives, ordered our footsteps to cause us to be prosperous. He has ordered your very steps to bring you into a place where your ladder shall be greater than the former, where the reaper is about to overtake the sower. And you will see Ephesians 3 and 20 manifest before your very eyes, which reminds us that our God is able to do just what he said he would do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think. According to the power that works in us. Amen? But we've got to take the next step. We got to embrace this process. Everybody wants the blessing, but nobody wants to go through what it takes to receive it. We want to see the anointing on somebody else's life and hope it's just going to rain down off of a cloud into your head. That is not reality. Every person who has done anything great for the Lord has always had to go through a process. They had to embrace the process. In Esther, the second chapter, verses 12 through 18, Haggai, who was the keeper of the women, in verse 8 is where he's named. He had a year-long beauty treatment to prepare each woman for the king in preparation just for one night to lay up with homie. One night. They got, hey, well, I can't remember who sang it. I want to say it was Eminem. You only got one shot. That was it. You only got one shot, and that was it. You had one year to prepare yourself to be with the king. Now, in this preparation, there was a prescribed diet, the application of special perfumes. They applied makeup to their faces, and she probably had to take some kind of a course on etiquette. Because royalty acts different than the common person. Catch that somebody. They dress different than the common person. They eat different than the common person. Nothing about royalty mixes with those who would be considered paupers or in poverty. Uh-oh. Once Esther was chosen, ha, ah, hear that. Once Esther was chosen to be in the king's company, she had to let go of everything she thought she knew. She had to let go of her past, and she had to choose. She had to make a choice to embrace the new process that was set before her. This is no different than if you and I would be called by the king. He's identified things operating in us. We would still have to embrace the process, but the way you have to embrace it is not just saying I'm going to do it. You've got to not only embrace it here, but you also got to embrace it here. See, let me tell you about us. We'll say one thing. I'm called. I'm a prophet. One time we was in Jamaica, y'all. Angie already laughing. She know where I'm going. We was in Jamaica. We in Ocho Rios. Now, these people are pretty smooth. Let me tell you what they did. You know, they're trying to get us to buy. And so they see the three of us, and they're like, we got to split them up. Because if you don't get them apart, one is talking to the other, the other's talking to the other. And every time we offer them something, they're saying no. And before we knew it, we walking around, having a great time, enjoying ourselves in Jamaica. And next minute, you know, I get to the next shop, and I'm like, I don't hear no laughing. Where are my sisters? And so I go, and I'm, the person's like, no, no, ma'am, this, this shirt right here is going to look great on you. And I'm like, no, it ain't. Where are my sisters? So all of a sudden, you see me going in every shop. Where's Debbie and Angie? Debbie and Angie, where y'all at? Where are my sisters? I'm looking for them high and low. Because I don't know, because some of these men, the way that they approached us was nasty. They let us know what it was, what they wanted from us. Oh, young people, y'all need to hear me. When the little nasty man come to you and he get to talking all about your body parts and all those different things, go ahead and leave. Because that's all he's going to ever want from you. So anyways, when I'm looking for him, I'm looking for him. Finally, I see Angie. And so I, I said, where is Debbie? And she was like, I do not know. I didn't even realize we was apart. I said, come on, let's go. So we go and we find Debbie. She's back here. And I can hear her voice. Well, that's a nice shirt. <laughs> and I'm like, I 
hear her, but where is she? So the person got her back here behind this special deal area where he's going to give her some special deals. And we're like, no, you're not. If you're going to give her a special deal, we're going to stay right here until this special deal is done. So before we know it, we're talking to the people. And somehow or another, I think it was Angie, that said, this is our pastor. Watch your mouth. And so, because they was doing their little nasty talk and everything, and before you know it, we're at, still at the top where all of the vendors are, and there's an entire row all the way down that winds like this, full of vendors. By the time we got to the middle, people were coming out saying, I heard you're a pastor. Can you pray for me? So then, next minute you know, somebody comes up and they say, well, are you a pastor too? And Angie was mad by then because she ready to get out of there because they stopping us at every turn. And Angie says, no, I'm a prophet. You couldn't have paid me to ask her to prophesy nothing over me. I'm sitting here looking at her like, Jesus. She said it so hard, I'm a prophet. But guess what? We got through the rest of them vendors and they ain't bother us no more. Them people were like, whoa, let me tell you something about other countries. When it comes to prophets, they don't play with them. Because ain't no prophets over there, they're going to come and they're going to read all their mail and tell them the truth. This whole naming and claiming stuff that we got going on over here, they don't play that over there. They'll run you up out of there. They take their God very seriously. So we get through and everything, and we're all laughing. Isn't it funny that when she uh, took that gifting that it showed up? Mm. But here's the amazing thing. We'll say stuff like that. I'm an apostle. I'm a prophet. I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. We say it out of our mouths, but we've taught our spirit not to believe our words. We open our mouths and we say anything. We lie about stuff. And that's why our spirit just be sitting there asleep, not even knowing what's going on. Because all we do is talk. We don't believe nothing that we say. You've got to understand that if you are ever going to embrace the process, you've got to know what it is that you are confessing over yourself. You've got to renounce and denounce every lie. You've got to renounce and denounce the crap that people spoke over you. I don't care if it was your mama, your daddy, your brother's cousin's uncle, baby mama. I don't care who it was. Shut it down if it don't agree with God. In the name of Jesus. In 1 Peter We've got to convert our minds. It's very important. We've got to convert our minds to understand that being in the king's company, you are royalty. First Peter 2 and 9 says, but you are a chosen people. Esther was chosen. You are a chosen people. So she's not the only one who's chosen. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness that means ignorance, too. We think darkness is always serving witches. But what happens when you're ignorant to purpose? You're dark. You don't understand. The only way to get rid of darkness is to do what? Turn on the light. When you turn on the understanding, when you turn on the acknowledgement of who you really are, and you choose to believe it, that's when you're going to see conversion in your mind. Acts 3 and 19 says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. If you need to be refreshed, if you know your joy bubble has been busted, if you know that you haven't been receiving the presence of God, you've got to get in the presence of God and then he will release his presence within you and it'll change all of that around. That is the only way to be able to drive out the darkness that is before you. The word convert means to change from one state to another, to change to another form, to return back. What is it that we're returning back to when our minds are converted? We are going back to who we were when we were dispatched to the earth, when God assigned us here. Don't you know there's other heavens? The Bible says he is the God of the heaven and the heavens, plural. So there's more than one area, you guys. He could have put us anywhere. We could have ended up being a molecule on Mars, but we're not. We're here. The thing that we want to go back to is to who we were before we got entangled and bound by the world's idea of who we are. 
Too often we take on what somebody else believes that we should be. Somebody sees us singing a good song, but that does not mean that is where God has anointed you to be. Sometimes God wants you to use that same mouthpiece to be able to preach the word of God and not just sing the word of God. Sometimes he needs you to use your same mouthpiece to be able to prophesy over somebody, to edify them, to, in, uh, to uplift them, to help them to see beyond where they are and not just sing a song. A lot of times people don't even realize it, but we worship worship. It's true. They'll be up there and they're praising God with all their heart and we'll be saying, sing, Abby, sing, Jaleel, sing, Anna, sing, Shar, sing, Tanil. We're worshiping the worship instead of our focus being on him. We got to convert the way that we see things. We got to convert it. Romans 12 and 2 says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, re is a prefix that means again. Bring your mind back to the beginning, back to when it was new, when you was a baby and you didn't know nothing. Go back to that place and learn God all over again. Here's what we've got to understand. A baby has faith that can move mountains. I don't care what they're standing on top of. If they see their parent, they're going to take a leap. And you're not even prepared for it. And you're trying to hurry up and grab them. Oh, my God. And, and you're shaking because you know the dangers of it. But their faith says, my parent will never let me fall. And when we get that mindset, the Bible says, if you go back to as being a little child, if we get that mindset where we trust God that much that when he tells us to go, we'll leap. That's when we're going to see some change, y'all. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 says, But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, God, if we would embrace this process, God is going to continually change us until we look just like him. We are going to be able, he'll look at us as if we are a mirror, and we're going to reflect him but it's going to take for us to loose ourselves of old mindsets of failure, to loose ourselves of the rejection, to loose ourselves of condemnation by washing yourself with the water of the word of God. People of God, we've got to embrace this process. There's no other way. It is not going to work if God is not with you and you don't trust him. Now, here's the deal. Once Esther was chosen, she had to make a choice to let go of her past. For my note takers, I need you to note take that, amen? She had to choose to let go of her past, and she had to, in, had to choose to embrace this process. She went through a soaking. She went through a scrubbing. She went through training. She went through pruning to make her look the part that she was stepping into or being elevated into. This process removed the stink. It removed the mindsets and the very appearance of the common person. Many of us reach this Esther phase of the process of elevation where we have to be scrubbed of the world's practices, washed away from old doctrines and the retaining of releasing the roots from where we came from or who we have become apart from God. We got to believe God for restoration of our mind and our faith as we're embracing this process. Let me share with you what happened to me. I had had surgery after they had um, done the surgery to remove the tumor. Once they cut the tumor out, they also had to check my lymph nodes to find out if it had spread anywhere. And so they had to cut um, out of this side as well as this side. And because of the cutting away of the flesh, when they sewed me back up, and I talked about this on Thursday, it caused what is called courting. And so my arm was only able to elevate to a certain place. I could do this but I could not do this. Now, anybody who knows me and has seen me in worship, this is a problem for me. 
because I will always lift my hands in surrenderance to my God. So here I am, and I'm trying to embrace this process because God had already told me, I had already shared it with all of you, of what God was using this situation for. So I'm trying to reach up and grab something on the top rack of my closet, and I have to turn and use this on. I'm trying to grab some cereal because I've got the phone in this hand because I had forgotten my headset, and I go to reach up and grab cereal off of the shelf at Walmart, and I can't reach it. Next time I'm reaching to grab something else, my arm won't move, and I can't reach it, and I break down and I start crying. I started to lose faith in what God had told me. I was saying one thing with my mouth, but my heart had something else in it. My heart had some doubt. My heart had some fear. My heart had some questions that said, God, is this really true? Did I really hear what you said? God, this is not right. How come I can't lift my arms? God, if you're going to heal me, I need you to heal me all the way. But one, two, three times I wasn't healed, and I had to fight this process in my head. Too often God will give us something, and instead of us believing all the way through, even though it hasn't manifested in the natural, we turn and we walk away. And we say, God ain't going to do it for me. So finally, I come to church. Now, I didn't been to church, and you guys saw me, and I could only do my arms like this, and that was it. And one day, I finally just stopped fighting about it. I had almost given up that I would ever get full range of motion of my arm. And I sat here, and Raisha can tell you, because she had to come and get me dressed. So I came here, and we're worshiping. And I'm worshiping, and all of a sudden, my arm goes all the way up. And I'm worshiping, and then I don't even realize that it's all the way up. But when I do recognize that this has happened, the tears just roll down my face. My kids walk through the door. Now, they know what I've been going through. They saw me break down that last time. So they walk through the door, and they're sitting back there, and I'll never forget it. Because all I could do was go, oh, my God. And then I grabbed the microphone and had to share with everybody the healing that had just manifested right here in this house. Somebody's been looking for healing and it hasn't manifested yet. God wants you to know that he is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. He is no respecter of person. If God can do it for me, he can heal you. If he can heal the person who was 38 years lame, he can heal you. God is saying, be not weary in your trusting in me. Because you're going to reap if you faint not. We hit this part too often and we start crying and whining. It's so hard. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not ready. We, we've got to get all of our prepared excuses out. we got to start embracing the fact that God is training us to reign, everybody. God can't and won't use us if we don't complete the process in order to complete it you gotta embrace it and see it all the way through the next thing you gotta understand about embracing the process is this elevation requires separation she had to leave everybody that she knew she had to leave the family that she trusted and allow God to bring her through the process. Did it ever occur to you that bad things that happen to us can be used by God to help develop us in our purpose? Do you not realize that she was an orphan? So she was used to not always being with her family. Anybody else would have stayed stuck back there at the fact that they were an orphan. But it was that very capability to rebound after something like that that helped her to shift into her purpose. My God, if we're going to embrace the process, we must stop whining and we got to start winning in Jesus' name. And during this phase, we are literally being anointed, y'all. Oils and perfumes, that, that's anointing. And we're being appointed. That means we're being arranged, we're being set, we're being provided with what is necessary, we're being equipped, we're being furnished in preparation for our call. Oh, somebody should have gotten a revelation right there. You got to know that there is purpose in your pain, but we've got to embrace the whole process. We can't quit. 
in the middle. We can't get tired and say God ain't doing nothing. Check this out, y'all. This blew my mind. Each of the women were being trained to do one thing, satisfy the king. The one who pleased the king the most would become the one that was closest to his heart. Did y'all catch that? Get out of the sexual idea of it. They were doing one thing, preparing themselves to please the king. What would happen if we changed our mindset to that? To where our only desire was that to satisfy the desires of the king. And in return, we would be closest to his heart. When you're in pursuit of the heart of the king and not the hand of the king, the providential favor of God will overtake you. Haggai gave Esther special treatment, and he gave her the best place in his house for her and her maids. He shared the secrets of the king with her. He let her know exactly what the king liked, what he didn't like. He positioned her in ways that set her apart from everybody else that she was around. Here Esther was a queen. But she was born an orphan. She made it to the palace and was living a wonderful life when the people of God were being attacked and their lives were on the line. But it was Esther that not only had the heart of the king, but she also had the ear of the king. We must know that there is power in our position and that God's heart is for us. But even beyond that, his ear is always toward his people. Just as God says, my sheep know my voice, you got to know that you know that you know that God knows the cries of his people. He heard when Abel's blood was crying out from the ground. He heard when Hannah was crying out at the altar because she didn't have a child. He heard Elijah when he thought he was the only one left that had not bowed his knee to Baal. God is not an absentee father. Like a mother knows the cry of her child, so does God know the cry of his children. God is saying, open your mouth. You've got my ear. last thing is this when he elevates you there is an expectation that you will produce results you must dispense from the position that he's given you your elevation is not about you notice that Mordecai told Esther that she had been chosen promoted elevated, handpicked for such a time as this. We make the mistake of getting a position and we forget about everybody else around us. We become like the baker who said, oh, I'm going to remember you when I get in the palace, but never came back for him. We will send a message to somebody because they can't get into the king's palace where we are instead of being the message God needs us to be. We've got to understand the difference between a title and entitlement. There is no title in the earth that does not have requirements and responsibilities that usually serve a group or a people. We want titles, but we don't want the towels that come with it. We want everybody to recognize us as being something, as having this title, as getting all the accolades, everybody recognizing us when we walk into a place. That's a great thing. But do you understand that he's requiring of you. Greater is he that lives in you that he did, than he that is in this world. He's looking for you to use what he's placed on the inside of you in the position that you're in for those who are up high with you and even those who are beneath you. He needs you to use it. He needs you to produce results. Title is described as a descriptive or a distinctive designation. An entitlement N, E-N means to cause, and title means to give right to claim. So we can't think that we're just entitled because we have the title. You are entitled to the blessings of the Lord that maketh rich and adds no sorrow with it, but don't think that you're entitled for everybody to bow down and serve you. Because what happens is we take God's glory once we get the title. He's got to work all of that out of you before he elevates you. We get that I'm the queen, so you need to figure it out type of attitude. 
We see all that's going on in the world, but we sit back unbothered. And that is not what he is looking for from his people. He's looking for us to be a family, to come together, to work together, to raise the children together. We are to watch out for one another. The Bible actually talks about if a man loses his sheep, that you are to take it in and take care of it until he comes back to get the sheep and then give it to him, well fed and taken care of. Your reward is going to come from heaven. Every dime that you already put out, God's going to restore. The Bible is clear. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's times four any way that you look at it. We must know and understand, in closing, that our position with the king would be used to accomplish the will of God for his people. We all say that we want to advance the kingdom of God, but recognize that taking territory for any king is not going to come without great price. And trust me, baby, it ain't coming without a fight. We are in a time where church is being redefined. Leadership has no accountability. Evil is being called good. They're putting God's name and stamping it on stuff that has nothing to do with him. There's a mixing of the holy and the profane. In the eyes of man, the church is no longer a viable answer to all of the world's issues. When God set the church in the midst of a city to be a light on top of a hill. Many look at this as a bad thing. We complain about all the things that we see versus understanding and seeing the opportunity, the great harvest that is before us. People of God, with elevation will come several life-changing events and things or situations that have been purposed to cause us as a whole to believe again. Even with COVID-19, every last one of us is having to choose to believe regardless of what the doctors say, regardless of what the news is saying, regardless of what is happening around us. I don't care who caught it. We ain't getting it. We are protected. We are covered by the blood. And we have to utilize our faith in the midst of this. No matter what is going on, saints, we are being equipped so that we can equip the rest of the saints of God for the work of the ministry to do miracles and the deployment of apostolic and prophetic leaders again. God is calling new beginners to get up off our old lasso and to begin to step into position. Believe God's word again. Embrace the process. Deal with the issues of our mind. Let go of the past and move forward so you can dispense for him. In Jesus' name, oh, give the Lord some praise today. Come on and stand to your feet. We have to learn to produce fruit that remains. Flesh will always rise up. It's going to tell you to be afraid. Flesh is going to tell you, no, that test that I just took was wrong. You're going to take it 75 times and it ain't going to change. You can argue with it all day long, but you answered the questions. At the end of the day, you have been called, chosen for such. You were born on purpose, for a purpose, with purpose, for such a time as this. We can no longer be neutral when it comes to human lives. He's looking for us to take him seriously. Stop just coming to church and become the church. Becoming, becoming who he dispatched us and designed us to be. Not who we've become apart from him, not who we've become because somebody told us to do that, not who we've become because of the things that happened in our past. And I don't know who I'm talking to in here on today, but somebody's really struggling with detaching from the old, detaching from past mistakes. I don't care what it was. It can be homosexuality. It can be whatever. You could have molested somebody. Whatever it is, it's covered under the blood. I'm not going to ask you to come up because it is sexual sin and you don't need to put your business out like that. But what I am going to tell you is this. 
God has forgiven you, and you've got to make a choice to know you've been forgiven. You've got to choose to release it and let it go. You've got to know that he has your best interests at heart and that he still can use you. God can still use what the world would call damaged goods. You guys have seen me do the, uh, uh, the illustration with the two cans of corn. And you got the perfect Christian that has no dents in the can. And then you got the other can where I take the hammer and everything in life that hits it, I hit the can. But when you pour out what's on the inside of the can, they look exactly the same. God inside of each and every one of us looks exactly the same. The way we dispense our anointing is different. Hear me. You are forgiven. I don't care how young or how old you are, you're forgiven. There are people who die not knowing they've been forgiven. They literally have terror in their eyes, and I've seen it. I stay with them until they take their last breath, and they're afraid. One woman literally fought with her last breath. They pronounced her dead, and she sat straight up and started coughing and choking because she was fighting. She did not want to die. She was afraid. And when you know God, perfect love, and he is perfect love, casts out all fear. Fear causes torment. I bind the spirit of fear right now in the name of Jesus, and I command you to go. You felt that breaking. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. And I plead the blood of Jesus over that person. And I thank you, Father, for releasing them, for delivering them. In the name of Jesus. For giving them that peace. Let it rest on them right there, God. Yes, God. Peace be still. We trust you, Father, and we thank you. If there is anyone in the house on today that has not given their life to Christ, and you have a desire to do it, I want you to say this prayer with me. For those who are online, if, if you're doing it, and you want to let us know that you just gave your life to Christ, go ahead and repeat it and type it in. Say, I receive Jesus. So say with me, Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for my sins. And, Lord, after you died, you went to hell, and you took the keys from death and hell. Every person has to go to the grave, but my spirit goes with you. Your word declares that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I thank you, God, that because I believe that you died on the cross and I receive you as my Lord and my Savior, I believe in my heart, Lord, I am saved. So I thank you for this confession. That is the first step. And now, God, I am going to embrace this new process of conversion that you are going to take me through to help me with my mind so that I can exchange my mind for the mind of Christ. And I praise you, God. I will give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on and give the Lord some praise today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. For those who feel comfortable giving a 
godly hug. Amen. Go ahead and hug somebody. If you did pray that prayer today and you are um, now a new part of the kingdom, we want to welcome you. If you are looking for a place to call home, to worship, to be developed, to be discipled, amen, we offer you New Beginnings Discipleship Ministries as a place of worship for you. We're going to love you right where you are, walk you gently to where you need to be. Now, here's the deal. Just because you made that new confession does not mean that you're not going to have to fight. Territory. Your mind is territory. So you're going to be in a fight to fight the enemy from telling you the confession you just made is not real. He's going to try to make you think that you, you'd nothing changed. No, that's a lie. Everything just changed. If you walk out of here right now and die, you going to heaven. You are forgiven. Oh, somebody should have got excited right there. You are forgiven. It's a done deal. But there is still the conversion process. Now, when I come back from Ohio, I will share the second part of this sermon because we're going to start to dig up what God did with each of these different people. Amen. We're going to uncover some more nuggets that's in this passage of scripture. So I'll probably stay here for a minute. Amen. Amen. So give the Lord some praise and give some godly hugs. I love you all. And we'll talk with you soon.